Good afternoon, everyone. I thought this was an optimistically large room for a session <laughs> on machinery of government changes, and <laughs> as did my colleagues. And I think, um, I think we've been proven correct. Machinery of government, government changes immediately after lunch is a sort of unfortunate uh, piece of programming. I'm Graham Head, the New South Wales Public Service Commissioner. It's my job to uh, facilitate this session. Um, and the format is we're going to hear from our two speakers, Fran Thorne and Debbie Power, who I'll introduce in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, initially, they're going to each uh, present. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion between myself and the two speakers after that and then open it up to uh, to questions. The focus of this session is what is the question to which frequent machinery of government changes are the answer? And we're not going to attempt to glibly answer that at the front end of the session, but I might return to that at the end. So joining me, um, I have uh, Debbie Power, who's the State Services Commissioner from, the Deputy State Services Commissioner from the State Services Commission in New Zealand. And Fran Thorne, um, from Deloitte, uh, who's the head of the government practice at Deloitte, um, and both of whom, along with myself, have had long public sector careers, and we've been on the receiving end of machinery of government changes, and I suspect all of us have been involved in the architecture of some of those changes as well. So uh, without any further introduction, I welcome Fran to the podium, uh, and Debbie will follow her straight afterwards. Thank you, Graham. Um, if I can start by uh, paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land we meet on today, um, and I acknowledge and honour their um, ancestors and any um, other um, uh, senior leaders of the um, community who may be here today. Um, uh, I'm one of Richard Mulgan's um, intellectual gorillas. Um, and I'm going to wear that as a badge of pride from now on in because I think it sounds like it's a fantastic sort of title to have. I'm going to put it on my card. Uh, but I also have near on 30 years experience uh, working in government, uh, which has included more than my fair share of experience in, as Graham says, architecting uh, machinery of government changes, but also being on the receiving end. Um, and it is, of course, amazing how differently you view that experience depending on uh, where you are in the cycle. Um, I've been a little bemused by some of the conversation, both today but also regularly coming out in um, uh, conferences around um, government, and, or rather more particularly the public sector uh, and the vocation of the public sector, which has um, uh, sort of this elegiac tone that we're all in terrible decline and decay um, and there was a high point back in what was it, whatever, whatever it was, 1854, with the North Trevallian report, and we've been in decline ever since. Um, while I have a lot of fondness for tradition, um, a lot has happened in the 150 years between North Trevallian and today, um, and uh, not surprisingly, there is change. Um, and we, um, we need to spend a bit more time thinking about how um, we create a capable um, and, and, dare I use the term, agile public sector and public sector institutions um, that move with that change and continue to provide good stewardship um, of public services um, and public value. Uh, and so part of that tradition is indeed the machinery of government change. So this is a tradition of government and has been around um, almost for as long as there's been public services. Um, but it's one of those traditions, interestingly, that is almost universally derided uh, by those who work um, in the public service. They think it's a waste of time, it's a distraction, um, it's an imposition on their view of the natural order of things and that natural order of government. Um, and we spend a lot of time uh, fighting against it when it happens to us um, and complaining about it, but also having our own views about um, uh, what, it should, what should actually have happened. Um, and our question, of course, which is what's the question to which machinery of government is the answer, um, I just think, well, obviously it's a rhetorical question, um, but frequently it's not. And as I said, the, um, often people within the public sector themselves 
um, uh, have a lot of complaints about machinery of government. I have some sympathy with that, which I will deal with, but um, I, in general, my thesis is to have no sympathy with that whatsoever. Uh, so theoretically, uh, if you look in the literature, there's not a lot of what I call detailed examination of machinery of government um, as, a, as an artefact of the public sector. Um, if you go to the Australian Journal of Public Administration, there are in fact about 18, 856 articles in which machinery of government is mentioned, but very few of them actually deal um, in any detail. Um, the kind of progenitor of machinery of government uh, is often cited as the Haldane Committee um, in the UK in 1918, uh, which, uh, amongst other things, created or prepared a report on the machinery of government. Uh, and they were very trenchant in their view about what constituted and what was the best structure of government. They said there were two options for government um, in how it structured itself. Uh, it was either by the services provided or the persons or classes to be served. <laughs> and they came down firmly on the side of services that there was no argument to be had on this. It was all around um, bringing together skill and expertise and competency and a um, whole range of other things around the service to be provided. And by and large, uh, that continues to be uh, the main form around which governments structure themselves. However, of course, it has been moderated over time um, and we do see parts of government that are clearly around persons or classes. Uh, classes of persons um, who are to be dealt with, um, although I hope we take a slightly um, more collaborative view um, of the role of the public service and those classes and persons than we might have in 1918. So, of course, today we have a much more mixed model. Um, but as I said, there's not a lot of discussion of it in the literature um, and probably the place, a couple of articles I found that um, kind of really tried to define what it was uh, were some from the 1980s. There's been actually not much since the 1980s. Um, and it is around, you know, a choice of governments to give um, a particular policy a lot of weight or uh, a little more cynically a, an impression that they're dynamic and they're dealing with things and they're under control. Um, that they are, and this is a very serious issue, adapting to uh, the environment around government. So times change, the issues that are important change. Uh, they might also be about technical efficiency or, um, as most people feel, it's just about savings um, or the taking on of new functions which governments have traditionally not or previously not done. Um, and interestingly and importantly about the deployment and balance between ministers, which um, I'll come back to. Um, and another one was um, much brief and that just said it's about economy and efficiency, policy effectiveness and tactical political advantage. Um, so simply, um, but why? Why is it not much discussed? Um, maybe this is why. One of the features about machinery of government is that it is the exclusive preserve of the head of that government. It's one of the few things that heads of government get to do entirely on, off their own bat. Um, and they obviously do it with their departments. Um, this remains true across jurisdictions and geographies and over time. The question for today could have been, um, there could have been two quite different questions. We could have asked, to whom does it happen? Um, or why does it happen? We probably, we are more focusing on the why does it happen. Um, but the to whom does it happen is also an interesting one. It goes back to that history of um, why and what's the general form that machinery of government takes. So despite the fact that we talk a lot about the irritating changes in the structure of government, by and large, when you look at governments across most jurisdictions, um, there are certain core functions around which departments get organised. And it's um, smaller or more topical functions that change and move over time. So health is health, education is education, transport is transport, justice in its various forms is justice. And you see these organisations pretty unchanging over time. Um, there are, in fact, <clears throat> so those, the, the, there are, very, in fact, very few creation of entirely new departments. So in the time that I have worked, with, worked within the Victorian government, I can only think of three examples in the last 15 years. Um, and they were the creation of the D Department of Victorian Communities um, in 2002, 
which was about uh, seeking a new way of interacting with the community and dealing with place-based issues, um, and the Department of Sustainability and Environment, also in 2002, um, and understanding that planning and environmental matters needed to be thought of together, and the environment was becoming a much, much bigger issue. Um, and then in 2014, the creation of the Department of Economic Development, Jobs, Transport and Resources. Um, again, one of the most significant machinery of government changes that I can think of in this country. So the core functions don't much change. They rarely create a brand new department. Um, and it's small bits and pieces that seem to move the related activities, which are where there are multiple choices about where they could sit. So where does sport sit, for example? Is it a health activity? Is it a community building activity? Is it something else? Um, and these are the decisions that governments um, focus on often in their machinery of government changes. So if we cut to the chase, um, what is the problem with machinery of, that machinery of governments are trying to change? Um, as the literature said, there really are only a small number of reasons. The first is strategy. What we um, now use that abused term, the narrative of the government, uh, the story of its objectives um, and how it demonstrates them in a very particular fashion, how it organises the resources of the public service that is at its um, uh, disposal to work on these high order objectives. Uh, it is often about performance. People don't much like to talk about that, but sometimes it is about bad performance, an organisation that is failing. Uh, the clients or the services it's providing. Uh, it's also about priority, which is slightly different from strategy, at least in my thinking. Um, it's uh, likely to be much more narrowly focused and around a particular issue uh, or something that has emerged within a term of government. Um, it's also about control. This is another area people don't speak out loud about very much. Um, it is how a head of government and his or her agency can more actively manage the collective that is the public sector. Um, on a positive level, this is about achieving collegiality, shared purpose, um, cooperation across the silos uh, that departments um, inevitably become over time. Uh, at a more slightly, with a slightly more negative slant, it can lead to over-centralisation and removal of competing advice between line and central agencies. Um, that's if you're being a conspiracy theorist. Um, and politically, it does offer the head of government, the Prime Minister or Premier, an opportunity to balance um, the distribution of ministers and their skills by uh, the choices of where they make those allocations um, and increasingly seeing it in the form of lead and supporting ministers uh, where, again, control is exercised through a smaller number of senior members of the cabinet. Uh, finally, it's sometimes about cost, but not very often. Um, and um, as was pointed out to me earlier, uh, there's lots of evidence that the cost of machinery of government changes is huge uh, with little apparent benefit. Um, I would say that we probably haven't actually done the counterfactual of sometimes where um, the benefit is also measured. But um, they're the, they're the brought my take on 30 years of observing and being involved in machinery of government changes really the five reasons that governments do it. And it's in that order of importance. Um, I laughed out loud when I went looking at the various um, guidelines that have been produced by various governments or central agencies about machinery of government change. The reason I laughed out loud is I felt for the line agencies as they read this sort of um, august advice that told them that what governments expected, that of course you will take a whole of government approach, you will be constructive and open with your staff and you'll be accountable and you will all be operating uh, for the greater good. Um, and it is very easy to say those things when you're telling people what they should be doing and how they should be acting. The felt experience generally for people who are on the receiving end of machinery of government changes is it's often poorly explained, so they are built bewildered by the change um, and react with a, what would they know about what it's like to be doing whatever it is we're doing. Um, it is all focused on speed rather than real change, so the process of affecting 
the actual machinery of government change has to happen very quickly and there's almost no attention given to how do you actually then do the next work which is bringing and putting into place what are the objectives of the machinery of government change, um, the purpose of it, um, often because people lose attention and move on. Um, it often results in guerrilla warfare between <laughs> departments as they descend almost to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat over that last person uh, that they're all fighting over because there is very little support provided from the central agencies to manage the the, you know, the demerging of organisations and the re-merging of it. Um, people on the receiving end of this feel a great deal of indifference, the kind of get on, get over and get on with it. I have been known to say that myself. Um, just get it done. Uh, but you know, how would you know this is a department of 12,000 staff and we're suddenly going to be moving them all over the place and they don't know what's going on. So getting on and move, getting over it is a little harder than you might think. Um, but finally, when you look at it and when you realise that at least there is machinery of government at least every three or four years and sometimes in between changes of government or, or turnover of terms of government, why can't we get the under, underpinning infrastructure right? We know it's going to happen. It is a right of the head of government. It's a right they choose to exercise. So let's get the stuff, uh, the ICT, the people stuff, the financial stuff fixed so that we can do it much more simply. I'm just going to quickly look at three cases. Um, the first is the Department of Victorian Communities back in uh, 2002. <coughs> it was a post-election machinery of government change, so a government entering a new term uh, with a massive majority um, and had spent four years thinking about what it might do if it got another term. Um, and this was one of their core, um, uh, core thoughts that they um, had had, which was about thinking of a new way about how we deal with how the government reaches out to the community, um, starts thinking about uh, coordinating around place um, and coordination of other services. Um, there was what we call detailed design in the Red Book. Um, I was involved in the preparation of this. Um, I laugh now when I think of the detailed design. It was um, uh, hardly a guidance. Um, it really was a description of what was actually going to be the strategy and objective and what parts of government were going to come together and that was it. There was no other guidance and no other support. It had some, I think it had eight ministers. So there was really about one or two ministers who had lots of power, big portfolios, and a whole bunch who had very little to do um, in terms of oversight of functions or services, tiny, tiny access to budgets, um, and the management of this across a, what was actually a very small department wasn't particularly well thought through. Um, and as I said, um, uh, there was absolutely no oversight of the implementation um, against the strategy. Um, my other two cases in practice refer to the same department. Um, again, in Victoria, the Department of Human Services, a department that had existed over 18 years and had been itself built up through various machinery of government changes over 18 years. First health and community services and then housing came into it, 18 years. Um, in 2009, for reasons of priority, um, it was decided to split it back into two departments, the Department of Health and Human Services. So I was on the receiving end. I was the head of the department at the time. 
Um, I was under instructions to talk to no one about it. It was a secret. I couldn't even talk to the ministers about it because they didn't know. Um, and to work with the central agencies on the detail of how this would be affected. Uh, and this had to be done in the course of a couple of weeks. It's actually very hard to demerge a department by yourself <laughs> with central agencies who don't often understand the intricacies of the powers of uh, various bodies within these departments. Anyhow, it happened. They split very quickly. It was really interesting. So a department that had been together for 18 years split straight away. So it said something about the parts of that department and uh, the enduring histories and uh, internal cultures of different parts of the department. They became the Department of Health and the Department of Human Services um, and happily went their ways and proceeded to fight as departments of, with similar remit do over time. Um, and then in 2014, uh, when the re-elected, oh, no, sorry, newly elected um, government, uh, Labor government, uh, current government in Victoria came in, there was a reintegration of the two departments. Um, and again, this was a smashing together of two large, well, one large iceberg in terms of dollars and another large iceberg in terms of staff, um, and an expectation that somehow this department uh, would have been recreated rapidly um, in time. Um, the problem with both of those, both the demerger and the remerger um, of uh, those departments, was that it was very hard to explain uh, to anyone at the time what was the purpose of this. So even though there was, the first time around, there was a very clear purpose. Uh, there was in the mid midst of um, health reform, uh, so the then Premier wanted a department that was absolutely going to focus on nothing but health reform, but there was also concern around child protection and the belief that this needed serious focus and whoever was focusing on health reform couldn't give it sufficient focus. So that was easy to explain. Uh, the reintegration um, has appears to have been much harder to explain to people. Um, so, set, so that clarity of purpose um, has not really been brought across. There is the difficulty of execution. So these are two very big departments here in their own way. One, as I said, in budget, the other as in staff. Um, they have entirely different operating models um, and uh, really two years later, um, the reintegration is still an ongoing issue. Um, they have a relatively new secretary um, who is now pay paying some attention to what I'd call the kind of new structural arrangements and organisational arrangements that will be required. But basically for about two years, they've sort of milled around each other um, and not necessarily um, integrate as well as they can. And then there's the impact, the impact on the level of attention that has been given to um, a range of um, critical services. Now, you might say from this and from what I've just said that I'm not a fan of machinery of government. Um, the op absolute opposite is the truth. Um, I think there is a real place for machinery of government change. I think they are a very, very powerful instrument for telling the public service and more broadly the public what the priorities of the government of the day are. Um, and they are the right of the First Minister. So they are very much his or her stamp of what are the objectives that we are here to achieve. The fact is the core functions remain pretty much the same. It's relatively, for all the drama we feel about it, uh, smaller changes that occur.
through is that post-transition phase, that heady one or two months of arguing over the administrative orders, arguing over the people and the dollars and the what have you, and then the real focus and attention to explaining to the new department what the strategic purpose is and spending time on recreating an organisation, recreating a culture of purpose and performance around that new organisation. Generally, by the end of the two months, everyone's got so tired of it, they have moved on and they are not thinking about what it takes to create an organisation. So it took me a long time to learn this, but I did finally learn it. Um, I don't, would never have said that I was expert at doing it, um, but as an observer of machinery of government changes, I am a fan. I think the answer to is a really easy question to answer. Um, it's about strategy and purpose, um, and its problems are all about how we execute it. And um, as leaders in government, um, people like yourself, Graham, um, and central agencies should be thinking about how you create an environment that is less sticky in the underpinnings that makes the strategy and purpose easier to achieve um, and more obvious and desirable than it often feels like at the time. Thank you.